theme of today is writing today. And in my mind, there's two possible interpretive permutations, right? So the one is, how do you write about this moment? How are you black and young and writing about the year or the period in which the people who are our heroes and leaders turned out not to be? And the people who led us were the people um, we were supposed to be teaching and passing the baton on to. Um, I think then the second permutation is more BBC Africa-ish. How does it feel being an African writer in this space? But because we're all family and the same people in the same room, we're not going to do that part today. So to open, um, I've asked the writers to please just prepare readings um, from their respective books. If we could start, how uh, would we pronounce it? Um, I'll be given four minutes to read, so I'm going to read four pages of the book. I'm going to start at the beginning, because I think it's much better to start at the beginning. Um, and it just opens up what is in store for what's coming. I'm going to start with chapter one. I have many names. My mother calls me Nwele Zelanga because of my golden hair. Some call me Mshope because of my fair almost ginger skin. One wise old woman of the tribe called me Metro Madana because of my big round eyes that reflect oceans of untold stories. The village girl who liked to taught me just called me that albino girl. I'm 13 years old, however, that's a distortion on its own. I'm young yet old. I've experienced the cycle of birth and death many times than I care to count. I've donned and shredded many skin colors in my lifetime. I've lived the lives of many, the lives of the poor and the healers of Bantu, and served the divided peoples in countless ways. I have also visited this world before as a barber tree and stood tall for over 100 years, exuding all the wisdom in the known world. I've made short visits sometimes as a carefree butterfly showing off innocence from beyond. One of my favorite incarnations was when I was a bird and we crossed the oceans with my own kind, reflecting the endurance of the immortals. On occasions, I have visited this world in less glamorous roles, such as in the form of work I've been, and worked all my waking life giving the world the sweet honey of my hard labor. I spend most of my time suspended in the hills of my humble village. I watch the clouds looking for messages from beyond. I watch them morph into countless symbols speaking the language of the gods. I struggle to decode some of the messages. I have to be patient. There are hidden secrets in the eternal knot of existence. Many think I'm crazy and find my favorite pastime as an excuse for being lazy. But I'm trying to talk my luck. They mock, calling me a little dictator. She's crazy, that one. The village woman gossip with their eyes. The heavens are not going to fall anytime soon. The young girls my age tease. They don't know any better. I've tasted immortality and bathed in its deep ancient waters. I've swam eons on end in the stream of eternal bliss. I've gone beyond all mortal emotions and painted the path in the unknown with colorless night. There are only stories of joy and profound peace in this foreign land. Freedom is the essence of our existence in the world of the spirit. I don't have many friends and I'm an outcast of sorts. The situation is exacerbated by the fact that I do not attend school. I'm found upon by my peers to put it mildly. There's one old woman, no Kubuloan, who's my friend. She's kind to me. She's a just a dancing spirit of a child, lifts her face up. She tells me stories of the land, stories of growing up in the village of Dengilizu. She comes with me up the hill sometimes, picking wild berries along the way. We have many things in common. We were both sent by the great spirit of Kamata to this land of the walking dead to satisfy earthly desires and pass messages from beyond. We have a purpose to serve, a divine responsibility to each one of us, children of the star. Along the cycle of birth and death, I somehow got tired of the pitiful physical existence and bad the all-knowing one for permanent residence in the world of the spirit. And my wish was granted. I have spent many folds of lifetimes in the land of the Holy Ones before being born again in this lifetime. All the words and emotions will fall short to describe the profound serenity of the spirit world we call home. I can be silence, light, or no thing in a few minutes. I can be... We play... I can be carefree as we, defying all space and time with no back in sight. We play games and multi-dimensional realities. The enlightened ones visit us for a while in the land of the divine before being summoned to earthly mission. We have fun knowing that the call for duty can fall any moment. The call came and I was ready to serve. 
for some strange reason that makes the confined and predictable world of the walking dead. It has its unique charms. The all-knowing one someone made to listen to the prayers of the woman who will be my mother. She wept as she kneeled on Mount Abanguri. Bless me with a child, my Lord, and will forever grateful. She cried. What is the use of a wife if she can bear children? I felt her pain. Grant me just one child, oh, oh, no, with mother, and I promise to give her all my love. She begged and prayed till her mouth was dry. I was born ten months later. The heart was dark and humid. My mother lay like a log on the reed mat, half days after four hours of hard labor. The little clothing she wore was ragged and soaked with sweat. Beth is such a sharp shock, even for me, the one who's been born by women of different creeds. You should get rid of this thing, Nokwaka. What? My mother dashed forward with astonishment. Get rid of this thing this moment. The midwife squished. My mother sat upright, steaming with what you a baffled look written across her face as she stared with contempt at the old wavy woman. This is a bad omen. You've given birth to an albino. This is devil incarnate. Get rid of this thing that once just craved. This is my child. My mother snatched me from the midwife's arms. We should drown this ghost of a child in the nearest river. The midwife whispered the words much tenderness this time, this time around. The ancestors had warned me countless times to look out for a albino child will be born in the first moon of spring. She trembled with severe fear. This girl I was told would bring confusion that would lead to the demands of her tribe. She would bring nothing but illusion and would all jump willingly down the mighty high cliffs of some base to our death. The ancestor said I should. The ancestor said she would make false promises to the whole tribe about receiving a gift of immortality in the everlasting life. The white eyed woman narrated. But this is my unknowing child. My mother's maternal instinct was heard none of it. The departed ones told me that I would recognize her. But her mysterious round hairy black mark on her left shoulder blade, and I should sniff the life out of her on the spot. In an instant, my mother flipped me around to see the bed mark. She stared at it like a lost soul and where to refuse to come out of the mouth. A thunderbolt of lightning outside in use and loud shriek from the base of her gut. She cried like a woman who just lost a child. Buckets of rain fell at that moment and dark heavy clouds hovered in the sky. We should get rid of this baby child. The midwife continued in her persuasion. The mighty roar of the heavens infused fear in the two women, and after some time, my mother finally relented under the midwife's spell and agreed to get rid of the unwanted child, and so they thought a plan of action moving forward. The midwife grabbed the little child by the right ankle and gently wrapped my whole body with a oak cloth, and they left for the mighty Mpolosi River. They crawled in the thick top grass to shy away from any prying eyes. The rain came pouring down, and gallons of water quickly filled up the river. The little woman didn't think twice, throw me down the flowing river to drown to my death. They return home and never look back. I think I'll end there. Uh, so Tutu, he's very nervous, guys. Um, so he's going to read from us. So this is not the Ken Prison story, no? No. 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 That's not. Okay. Um, so I've been trying to write some essays. Um, I, I don't think I have the skill to write sort of like uh, essays that try to grapple with politics. So I've been trying to write this personal essays. Um, so part, part, part of this essay is uh, my story, but also other people's story. So this one is uh, set about me. <clears throat> one morning in December 2004, around 4 a.m., two police officers, whilst patrolling the night, made an unsettling discovery. A young man, whom at first they thought of as a ghost, was sitting on the tie road between Tsome and Kofumawatan in the Eastern Cape. If you were to drive on that same route, the young man would be seated just as you drive out of the small bridge over a water course after the Kotumbawa Hospital on the tar road that stretches in a straight line towards Somo, with villages on either side of the road. It would be minutes later that the young man would fully be aware that he was at the police station and that his name is Lidutu Malingan, and that the previous day he had come to town to buy milk and cigarettes for a neighbor. It is now 12 years later after the incident and I still cannot fully recall how I ended up in the middle of the road, in the middle of the night. 
and much of the events that immediately unfolded come to me like a dream, a series of fading images that I had to make out. Years after the event, I read Kazuo Ishiguro's The Unconsoled and felt a strong sense of familiarity with Ryder, its protagonist. Ryder arrives in a central European city that he cannot identify to give a concert he cannot remember are going to give. Ryder meanders through the city, looking at architecture that only looks familiar, as he has no recollection of ever seeing it, encountering strangers, at least to him, and honoring engagements he cannot remember agreeing to. It is because of this unreliable memory that I came to be enchanted by the book, and it is how I recall the events that immediately unfolded after I had been found in the middle of the road. It is not so much that I recall them, but they appear to me as imperceptible images than a concrete memory. I see myself standing in front of a bar. I am talking to a man. I see myself sitting at a police station, answering a thousand questions I do not have answers to, and yet at the same time, there is something distant about these memories. Back at the police station, the two police officers admitted to the others that though they had had many stories that Back at the police station, the two police officers admitted to the others that though they had many such stories, they had never seen anything like it, and as such, they recalled the event with great exactness. The time was around 4 a.m., one said and the other confirmed. And describing my state, they both agreed that I was, though it was not very cold, shivering, disorientated and unable to speak. One of them claimed that I was sitting on the white lane that splits the two road into two lanes, with my arms clutching my legs. The other confirmed almost all the details, only that the arms had been beside me, resting or holding on to the tire road. All the same, they agreed that this was, for both of them, a bizarre incident. Talking amongst themselves, the police officers, a dozen of them, agreed that I was a victim of witchcraft that I had been taken by witches and saved by my ancestors, although unlikely by my own will to leave. I had only been back in, the, in Sukhovan in my village for two days. I woke up with dark hard pimples across my face. I took a small mirror from one of the drawers beside my bed and went to sit on the red strip of the big house. It was early morning and the sun was soft and yellow. At the time, I dismissed the pimples as nothing more than my skin acclimatizing to the humidity of the village. The same thing had happened when I moved to East London, where I was studying. Looking out further into the distance, as I sat on the stoop, I realized then the stark difference between my village and East London. I had gone to East London to study radio and had, in my free time, begun to write poetry. The topography of the city did not allow for such stretches of sight. There was always a building structure, either residential or industrial in the way, unless you were sitting on the beach and looking at the endless Indian Ocean that lined the coast of East London. In an attempt to stitch together childhood memories, I walk around the yard, retracing the billion steps I had taken there as a child. Though there were now more houses, about four altogether, I saw myself, as a child, running around the new houses, disappearing in one corner and appearing at another at full speed. The old man, whose home was behind mine, was standing in his yard, a towel wrapped around his legs, his hands tightly holding a warm cup of tea and his wrinkled skin glowing in the morning sun. I was happy to see him. He had always been a magician when I was young, appearing. He was always a magician when I was young, appearing out of nowhere and disappearing in the night without telling anyone where he was going. Around us was only the hum of the village, a combination of animals, lakes, and flowing water from the river that was not far away. Right then, as if the universe was eavesdropping on my quiet thoughts and told someone, the old man asked me to go to town and get him a few things, milk and cigarettes. The old man was infamous for a lot of things, amongst which was his fondness for cigarettes and tea with milk. On any day, he would smoke two 20 packs of cigarettes, and he would down a cup of coffee in five minutes, and pour another, and then another, until there was no more tea left. The other was that he was a sangoma with endless unsatisfied customers that had tent enemies. I had not been to my local town, Kofimbaba, for some time, and yet to make a trip there, and I excitedly took up the opportunity to see it again. I had, heard that, I had heard that it had grown larger and busier, but if nothing else, it was its familiarity that lured me to it, and not its new fire grandeur. 
Growing up, the entire town had only one dusty main road, uneven back roads that had to be carefully navigated, old unassuming supermarkets, which were more like shops than supermarkets. A few of our lives beneath a mountain and above a river. From a distance of about five minutes from it, one can make out a sign made with rocks painted white on the mountain above it, above it reading, Welcome to Kofiba. I took a quick bath and filed out of, out of my home. Though the dead road to the Texas job had moved a few inches from where it was a year ago due to heavy rains, everything else remained unchanged. The houses lined along the dead road, their front doors and windows facing the road. People stared out of the windows at the people entering and leaving the village. If one turned their head quickly, one caught a curtain closing quickly and a figure standing behind it. After a short walk, I leave the village behind me without anyone greeting me. This pleased me to no end. I would have to explain that I was not working yet, but starting to be a radio DJ. And I would have to add, fearing that I was not doing enough in someone else's eyes, that every now and then, that every now and then I wrote some poetry, as if that would help. Though not being recognized that day pleased me, in retrospect, not being recognized by people I grew up under should have been the forewarning of what would unfold that day. When people who know you well can no longer recognize you, two things are possible. They have forgotten what you look like, or you have become someone else. To this day, I cannot decide which of the two was true of me that day. Sister? It feels very weird at Balabuka Echab because I think three or four years ago, I was 21, and so often Kinaloya go to book festival or go some events, go over the whole Kibale go day, and Kinaloya go to my page in Mohon Kibale and cringe at times, you know. Kiramara Malaka no one to the Nokota has in Goyana, you know. Ugadi wala kape diloza ba kaufa na yuko barako na wala puka yeka ugadi wala diloza. Because it's not like I can't really deal with that thing, but kikuli, you know. So abara mo na kichete chapter kwa dango hivi wala kivile kwa kichete chapter eshot kahol. Because kisha wako baby e mo tele kahol ite ite ita kisho kwa kichete niki di wala. So ekle wala kina ikuza ni kahol kufuta dawa tu kafela wali lemo lins kwa kileng abara dango bara dili tele ba kina ba kireba puka kushikuli shukum. So it's over from go page sixty nine, um, and I give I give a little bit of 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 which had claimed too many casualties and were breeding grounds for teenage pregnancy, drug abuse, and alcoholism. Tabiso, who had always got away with more than I ever could, somehow managed to top my mother out of her own enrollment, leaving me to go through it all on my own. And so in February 2003, I was enrolled for drama and singing lessons at the Johannesburg Youth Theatre in the northern suburb of Park Town, two taxis away from Soweto. I knew from the very first day I walked into the drama class that I would hate every minute of it. There was not a single black face in the room, not one. It was a sea of strawberry blonde and platinum blonde. There was long, there was long black hair, brunette, and even carrot hair. There were all kinds of hairstyles, except Afro or dreadlocks. There were green, blue, and grey eyes. There was even, there was every race in that room except the black race. It was as if I'd walked into a whole new world, a foreign planet where no black person had ever dared to tread. And and I was not only uncomfortable standing in that room, I was resentful. Oh yes, I was resentful. Resentful towards all those white and Indian children, not for anything they'd done to me personally, but for the vulgar opulence that defined their lives. They were dropped off and picked up by big luxurious cars in the mornings and after class. They had fancy sandwiches for lunch, food I only ever saw on magazines. They wore expensive jewelry and had cell phones. And I, the only black student there, walked from the taxi stop and had paloni with cheese every weekend. I had no fancy cell phone and yet, in the township back home, I was considered privileged. The injustice filled me with resentment and a great anger towards these students and teachers, none of whom was black. I liked nothing about the new theater. It represented everything I detested. 
the elitism of the institution was 10 times worse than that of my primary school. And this time around, I didn't hide my feelings from my mother. I went back home one afternoon and told her straight that I would not be returning to classes the following weekend. My mother, of course, would hear none of it. She made it clear that not only would I return, but I would learn to enjoy it. She accused me of being an ungrateful child who had no sense of appreciation for the hardships that she was going through to give me a better life. I lost the debate. I had, I had to return to the Johannesburg Youth Theatre and deal with the boring and snobbish white children who populated my class. A few months went by without incident. And then one, and then one day, a director of the theatre announced that they would be holding auditions for the following weekend for a big play that was coming up. It was called Sleeping Beauty. All of us were forced to audition for the roles in the play. I didn't put much effort into the preparation for my auditions. I didn't care whether or not I would make it on the list of the main cast. I didn't get any of the leading roles, but I was cast as a slave in one of the scenes. Rehearsals were torture. It was clear to everyone on set that I had no desire to be part of the production, and I suppose no one was brave enough to demand effort from me. When I think about it in retrospect, I realized they were caught in a catch-22 situation. They didn't want to antagonize me because I was black. And in the new South Africa, white guilt is the cousin of white supremacy. White people are afraid to confront us even on serious matters because they fear that exercising their authority, even necessarily, could be read by us as racism. In most cases it is. On the other hand, they could not take me out of the play because there would be no blacks left in it. And this would make them seem racist. Again, most of them were. They were all nice to me, and while I was in route, I didn't try too hard to fit in with them. During break time, I would sit alone reading or walk around the vast lawn on the premises, picking up pebbles and throwing them into the air. I had no problem being on my own. In fact, I preferred it that way. One afternoon, after a morning of running around and practicing scenes over and over again, I was exhausted. When my scene came up, in which I had to run to the stage and kneel before the wicked fairy Eva, who had poisoned Sleeping Beauty, I tripped on stage. Two of the directors jumped right off their chairs from the viewing gallery and shouted at me. I was extremely upset by this because many others before me had committed, had committed mistakes at the same point during rehearsals, so I couldn't understand why my mistake provoked such a scolding. I glared at both of them, swore quietly and ran off the stage. They were hot on my heels. I ran to the back of the building, closed myself in an empty room and sat quietly, anger seeping through every pore of my skin. A few minutes later, the directors ran into the room. One of them had tears streaming down her big blue eyes. She tried to reach out to me, but I turned away, my back facing her. In a calm voice, they pleaded with me to go, to go back on stage. Hesitantly, to go to the office. Hesitantly, I did. There, both of them apologized to me. One, speaking in a muffled voice, explained to me that they were just feeling tired and had caught them on a bad day, to which I responded without thinking. I'm tired too, and I'm also having a bad day, so you have no right to take out your stress on me because I don't take out mine on you. That was the second time I'd snapped at a white person. In fact, in fact, thinking back, I had never been, to, I, had, I had never been afraid of being vocal about my feelings towards white people. It had to do with my upbringing. For many years in my life, I'd been surrounded by men and women who had discussed the painful past. They always discussed the brutality that black people were subjected to under white rule, the brutality of being treated like animals. I grew up going to rallies where songs that spoke about the cruelty of whiteness were sung. This socialization left an imprint on my young mind. It taught me to rebel against anything and all white authority. I didn't return to the Johannesburg Youth Theatre after that. I simply told my mother that I would not go even if she beat me up. When she asked why, I told her straight in the eye. I looked her straight in the eye and told her without flinching, because I'm sick and tired of acting in plays about white sleeping beauties and singing songs by West Life. I don't want any part of this. Take me to a community theatre where I can, I, can, I can at least act out real stories and sing Brenda Farsi songs. Not this thing of white people. She didn't fight with me this time. She simply looked at me with a tight look in her eyes and said, Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, you can keep the mic because I want to pick up Gangan and Alentuk Alengayo Wakuma about how returning to this book is somehow cringe. And I think it speaks a little bit to what we're going to speak about today, about writing today. Because even though Kulili, at the moment that you wrote that, Big Queen is so good. You know, and so I guess then that speaks to the responsibility of documenting your moment, and also that the moment you produce something and you put it out into the world, is it even still yours? You know, so let's talk about this moment where you have to return to something that you wrote a couple of years ago, and you might feel a little bit different. Um, I've always said that the cringing and even 
the realization that some of the things that I have written here does not arise from the fact that I think any of it is not true, or does not arise from the fact that my politics on whiteness, on the black condition, anything has changed. Perhaps it, it, it arises more out of my own, you know, the depth which we, which, with which I would have written it now. You know, I mean, I think, you know, this memoir, it reads, and I, I think perhaps that's probably one of its strengths, it reads quite very simply. You know, it's a simple reading. It's, it's, it's a narrative of a particular life in a particular period. It's very simply written. And I don't think I delve too deeply into what I think, what, when I think about it now, I probably think I should have, I don't know. But when I read it now, I feel like, you know, when you're talking about white supremacy, could you explain it so that the person who's reading this and doesn't understand what white supremacy means, or a black child who's reading this, because, and one of the things, the reasons for this is because I've had quite a lot of young people, I, I always, I mean, members of the body has been read quite a lot, often by older people, but it's always very interesting to me when I hear a review from a younger person. And one child at the Steve Biko Center in, 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 in King Williamstown, a, a young boy, he's actually at, at the Broad University now, he's about 19 or so, Lee uh, stood up and said, you know, I want to give a review of your book. This is a young boy who grew up in the United States. His mother was a diplomat there and uh, came to South Africa, I think, about five or so years ago, so has been staying in the country since then. And he says, you know, I read your book, and I think it's quite an interesting book, but I, I don't know if I relate to these experiences, you know, and I don't think I agree with anything that you're saying, because I, as a black person, don't go through any of these experiences that you're talking about, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, when he got to Rose, he joined the black student movement. But, um, I, mean, I mean, and so for me, I feel like, perhaps why Lita would today, the same things I'm saying in my book, only now does Lita understand what it is that I was talking about when we sit together one-on-one -on -one and talk about these things at Rhodes. Perhaps the limitation could have been that I did not thoroughly explain them in my book because I was touching on, I didn't, I didn't deeply delve into the ideological base on which I was, I was explaining a lot of these things. And I think, in my view, and probably this is very unique and strange that people who write books don't often critique their own books so openly. But I think a, a serious critique that I give, a criticism rather that I give of this book is that it doesn't delve as deeply as I think it should on a topic that is so important and so necessary to be understood beyond just, you know, the experience of the subject, to go into the structural constructs of what do we mean when we're talking about this thing of blackness and feeling excluded. What does it mean in a deeper sense of the word, at, a, at, a, at an ideological level? And yeah, so I think for me, that that's the thing. It's not so much that I disagree with the book. I just think it should have gone deep. But do you think that that's the response? I'm going to pass it to Duduna. Do you think that that's actually the responsibility of a memoir written by a 21-year-old to deconstruct white supremacy, right? And I understand that once you put something in the world, there's a responsibility that you have that it nurtures where it reaches. It's going to you, Dudu, don't pass the mic. Um, but because you're in, the, like you're in the realm of production, of knowledge production as well, what is the responsibility of the work where it lands? Um. I mean, I, I think that in a, in a way, the, the kind of production of work takes different forms. Um, so when you are writing it, I think it, it absolutely, I think, is important to you and it means a particular thing. But I also think that when you then release it to people, I think as, as sort of like the producer of the work, you should be open to the idea that every single person who encounters the work will understand it differently, right? So so I think that it, it's a strange thing to kind of like insist that this is the responsibility of the work when in fact, once the work is out, that responsibility can be reinvented by the people who read the work. So I think for me, you know, at least the thing that I try to do is to be completely honest and open about what I write about. And I... You know, I am convinced that there's other people who will relate to the work the way that I do, but also I am open to the idea that there's other people who are going to relate to it differently, and that's completely fine. So, so, that, so then the responsibility becomes a thing of it's not only my responsibility; it's someone else's responsibility. Yeah, um, and also, I mean, just a, an, I went to a film festival, and and the director had. Um, done this documentary on these kids in the Eastern Cape who have to travel for five hours to get to school. So they start walking at like 4 a.m. and stuff. And one of the audience members was upset and asked the director, 
what are you doing about this? And the director was like, what are you doing about it? Right? That I've made the, the movie, it's not my responsibility alone. You've seen it, it's your responsibility as well. So I think that, I suppose in a way, um, is true for books as well. Yeah. I don't know, so that's a little, that's a little touch and go. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, you know, we had the sorry made minor shut down. What's this one that he made now, The Giants? It's fallen off. I'm going to continue. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. 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 So he made a documentary about Uzuma, The Giant Has Fallen, or The Giant Has Fallen, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it showed at the Joburg Film Festival. And there was a lot of outcries. So he's speaking about Uzuma and the downfall of this man. And never mentions one to quit. Like, what? <laughs> That was the beginning, right? This is where we knew we had a damn problem. We just voted a red with the presidency, you know? And the documentary doesn't touch on that. It doesn't speak to any black female intellectuals, academics. It speaks to white men about what black women might think about them. So he got a lot of critique and did a radio interview which got really picked and really ugly with the I think. And when he was asked, so the interview was a mess. And I really can't even, am I back? Um, and so the conversation continues on Facebook after. And for most parts, there were a lot of attacks, but some very serious questions, to which he responded that he was a filmmaker and was not in the business of affirmative action for black women. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? So you're just like, so what are you in the business of then? Which is why I'm saying is, while the reader has a responsibility, to interrogate this basis, how willing are we to be misunderstood in our attentions? Do you know what I'm saying? I'm going to pass this on to you because there's this dude, I think you met Jeff Ryman? Jeff? So he was, uh, I think, British and he was doing a tour on the continent a couple of months ago meeting African science fiction writers. And I read a very interesting like review that he wrote about your book and he called it um, African science fiction. Which is always a very strange idea for me, that amalgamation. Because what you're already saying by putting the African in front of the science fiction is that A, that these two ideas are divorced, and that they're being married in your imagination, you know? So for example, you've got Inole Zelanga, which is written as a fictional tale, but not so different in theme to what Ututu just read, which actually happened to him. So it's understood. I read that article that you, Jeff, uh, wrote. Um, other people had opinions about it, um, his phrasing and his definitions. Um, now, from my perspective, really, ooh, I think Jeff is just a minority, you know, uh, so I pay him no mind, you know. Um, the work speaks for itself. There's no definition, not even one, even if you want to use magic realism, there's no definition that would describe the work. So I pay no mind whatsoever. What's important to me is the message. And if you read the book and you get the message, that's the important. Not the one-line tech, you know, because it's much more than that. And it's, it's beyond the words. There's a feeling behind the words that penetrates from heart to heart. Words cannot explain everything. Words are just a signpost to somewhere deeper, you know, and you won't get there, you know, it's just a signpost. So, to me, I pay no mind. Um, I come from a background of, um, I didn't study literature, you know, and these terms that are technical, you know, I, I just, I pay them no mind, you know. Um, really, um, we, let's just speak logic, man. let's just understand each other, you know. Um, so, to me, uh, it's just something that I lose sleep about and I, I really, really, really do not think about. I've had many responses from different people, you know, um, and, 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 and most of the times when we don't necessarily, I've never sat with one person discussing the actual content of the book. It's always, there's this thing that we cannot discuss, which is a heartfelt thing. And when we sit there, when the person says, I like the book, I get them. Because I see in the face, I see in the eyes, I feel the body language. And these are the things that are not explainable. Um, so, um, to be too much academic about these things is really, you know, you're falling short, you know. Uh, don't stay here. 
too much. Be here. Oh. And, and that is my journey here. Um, and in terms of the book, and I repeat, Jeff is a minority, and we shouldn't be dis No one, if I'm using this example of Unwele Zelanda, um, most of the time people understand it, and that's the majority of the time. So I won't give people like Jeff a platform and give them too much energy. Cool, except these technical terms and these academic terms and the minorities, how many other people have written a review about you and this book, right? Hold on, let me finish. Because what I'm saying is that the product of your book is not the fact that it's now on paper and it's gone out into the world. It's that it continues from a historical legacy, right? Of writing, of speaking about ourselves, of people. And then after this production, people saying what you did is not what you said it is. Like you are not really who you're saying you are. And do we have, once you put the thing out in the world, that's what I'm asking about the responsibility, do you correct the misinterpretations? Not just Jeff. I'm mm. saying that because that's an example that I that I saw, you know. What really is the language in Tsum, in Ghani Kwan, just in Tsum, and just taking characteristic of in Tsum or in Ghani Kwan. There's what we now call storytelling. I don't know what storytelling is, but I know what in Tsum is. I know what in Ghani Kwan is. I know the characteristics of it. And when really the language, we use the characteristics of in Tsum. Heightened page. Keeping attention all the time, at least at the end, hold a candle, you know. Um, in Tomi, they, they have a teaching underneath, uh, uh, lying, you know. And in my, in my observing, you know, this world that we're living in, you know, there's a lot of disharmony, you know, uh, a lot of negativity in it, you know. Um, and he, they are not in Tomi, you know, to, to kind of like guide us, because in Tomi is culture, you know. In Tom is about us. So I will talk of in Tom, I will talk of in Ghanaian. God, I cannot talk magic realism because I don't know it. That was not my basis of it. And if you know in Tom, sure we can talk. But if you like trying to force me to talk magic realism or trying to force me to talk um, these <laughs> narratives that I don't know about, you know, it was in Tom. And I will repeat once more that it is a minority. And then the people who misunderstand the work, and probably it wasn't for them, you know. So I won't spend too much time trying to explain myself, you know. I rather the amount of energy that I have, you know, expand it to those who have an ear to listen, you know, to those who want to go beyond looking and actually see, you know, because we, we we're opening up outside five sensory reality here, you know, and these are not new things. We talk much realism. No, this is our life. Our life is not two worlds of uh, spiritual world and um, physical world. It's one world, you know. All these concepts, you know, these are new concepts, you know. We talk of one world and it's its own. And this description upon description, but these come with academics, you know, and. <laughs> That's not the world that I'm come. My, uh, 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 I am. That, that gives me input, you know. But um, would, would you discuss your work? So, so besides discussing it with academics, but would you be open to discussing your work and your responsibility of it with someone who's just a reader and not an academic? Um, sure, sure, sure. I can discuss the work. Um, and honestly, honestly, we. I've met a lot of people, and we we don't go deep in the in the work, and in terms of discussing. Okay, this happened to this person. This happened to this person. We don't go there, you know. Um, I don't know if uh, I am lucky, but the work penetrates, and it's such a feeling thing. And um, I think I will end there. I don't want to over explain myself. I think it's clear. <laughs> I think that he says, for me, something uh, uh, important, something important, something uh, uh, very important about when he says that, you know, it's, it's a minority of people who don't understand my work and perhaps it's not written for them. And I think there's something very important about that, right? Um, important even to me, right? Who, who wants who lead her to understand this work and to hear what it's saying. But there are there are people who it matters more to me that they understand it than others. Yeah. There are people who, for me, I take a direct responsibility 
to write in a way that I want them to understand. I'm not going to be particularly very bothered if um, a white person gets offended by my work or doesn't understand what it means. Because I don't expect a white person to know what blackness means and to, I'm not in the, in the habit of trying to explain blackness to white people, so I'm not going to sit there and be bothered because a white person doesn't get that. But it's important to me, you know, that members of the Born Free is understood by one of the It's important to me that members of the Born Free, it that it would be for me or it's celebrated coaching venue, whatever the case may be. And I've always said that, you know, as writers, and, and this is part of the theme of writing today, right? Um, this time, this moment, I think personally, and I'm not saying it should be true of every other writer, right? Um, personally, for me, I, I do think Hori, when we write, we've got a responsibility. And I think this responsibility perhaps is even much more greater on black people, and perhaps even black women writers than it is on anyone else. Because I do think that and especially being young, being black and being a woman, it's it goes beyond just the issue of pleasure. I don't write just for pleasure, you know. Of course if you enjoy it and all of that, that's great. But I can I can and I can wall if I'm trying to affair. There's something I'm trying to communicate about the space in which we find ourselves, the world in which we are occupying. And I want to believe that if they're not going to open up somebody something something anything It can at least guide one in the world in a different way, in a different way, right? Because then I know I'm just like anybody. You know what? And I always say I'm just like any other person who is in and all of that. The only difference is access And so that became a huge difference between And so hacking one for me, I write it with the understanding, or hacking one anything, I write it with the understanding of we are privileged as writers to be able to sit on this platform. It's not a privilege that everybody else gets to have. It's not every 21-year-old who gets to be published in South Africa and all over the world. It's not. It's a privilege of a few. And so when we write as writers, and I think as a young black person who writes, my responsibility must be to Manolo Kokasi, Oki Muxile Kokasi, who never got the same privileges that I got. That when I speak, Aki that when I speak, I'm speaking something that will speak life into us. And not so much when I look for her, I can't be bothered. But, um, okay. I just wanted to say real quick that it's very bizarre to me with Langan and Nongulu who's just like, I don't understand this idea of blackness when in fact it's their own damn invention <laughs> to fucking like, you know, push slave trade and capitalism and turn us into like livestock and cattle. It's very bizarre. Um, so then we're going to open for Q&As because we're running out of time. I also have things that I'm going to try to sneak in. So, so I wanted to, I think, um, to, to kind of explore the idea of writing for black people, right? Um, I mean, fair enough, I, I'm also not interested in explaining things to kind of like a... Uh, but what I wanted to know was what responsibility then do we have in explaining those concepts to black people, right? Because I think we can't work under the assumption that if you write a book that you are meaning for black people, that every single one of them is going to agree with you and understand the book. So what How do you? What do you think about this idea that you could write a book for you know, a girl from Middlelands, but she could still come to you and be like, I don't, you know. I think, I think for me, well, you know, I always say, but we're not homogenous. Black people are not homogenous, right? So we don't have the same experience even as black people. We don't have the same thinking as black people. We don't have the same upbringing, the same background, the same politics. We don't. And we escape well, because we have to call and we about one and that's one, right? So obviously, because even though we have to call and we have to call it clearly indicates anything you can play, even if you can play, but for me, what I mean is, I think the important thing for me is not so much that every black person must agree with you and everything like that, more so than it is about the work. 
I try, and I'm very conscious about trying in the things that I write, in the work that I do, to not be hateful to black people in general. You know, of course, there will be those black people who, in particular, would be offended about the things that you would be hurt by the things that you want. Some black people, but mainly, but back in Walanga, born, that was a Bako Kas, Yako Middle and Bako Nofai, Bako Kai, in very many ways, keep at Bako Luko, the Honanoko Krams Town, what was a township, go, 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 because my day, 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 like I said, I'm a But I think you must be very, I, at least I am, very careful about the way in which Musebetu Waka is received by Batawan Tuangata in Baite. I can't tell you what I'm going to do. I can't tell you what I'm going to do. I can't tell you what I'm going to do. I can't tell you what I'm going to do. I can't tell you what I'm going to do. I write conscious for it, but I want to go to the university and I want to go to the university. 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 You know, if you want to go to Kasiaka, you can go to And when I go to Kenya, it's for such a thing. If you want to go to Kasiaka, I think you can go to Kasiaka more than if you need the other way around. Can I just say something? Um, to me, writing is just one form of expression. Yeah? And I express myself in different ways. Um, writing is, is, is also a calling. But my biggest calling is this one. This is the one that took me out of Cape Town in 2009 while I was working. And I cut my clothes, I was working in Bethlehem, and I was, um, I was alone, and people would know you're crazy, you know, and stuff. Um, I went from 2010, January, and uh, lived back home in the Royal Heartland, in my uh, Flagstaff, Lusiki, and Pisana. And I was there. Um, and I was expressing myself differently now. I was expressing myself to dance, and I could find if but we are in and only, you know, you can dance and the room can go up in energy and, and there's healing, you know, and or oh, two songs, you know, or just you, just be in, you know, and stuff. Um, so the writing of Unwele Zilang, as I was telling my two sisters here, you know, um, it was, I was still that side. And the only reason that I'm here, back in the concrete jungle, was because of Nolis Lama, you know? Um, and it came while I was sleeping, you know? You, we have it, you know? When you say you sit, we sit and watch, say, for 6 o'clock, and you have, say, an anxiety in your sleep, you know? And very new, very, very new. And time is consciousness. So, with colonization, when we move to that paradigm, you know? It was a big F up, you know, in terms of our consciousness, you know. And Tina, as we grow, we go there, you know, we go as a person becomes an elder, they relate with the world of ancestors. And when they're much, much older, they even go further than ancestors to a world of myths. I'm just making an example. Then another thing um, that was inspiring the work, or that you wanted to deal within the work. Um, the feminine energy is rising, is rising, is rising, and is rising. Feminine energy is just that, it's energy. It is umoya, you know. It doesn't have gender. It is within males, and it is within females. But we know what happened over time, you know. Uh, the male species, you know, killed it within themselves, you know. And then they were threatened, um by the spouse with the person next to them, you know. Um, and sure, we are, women on a majority are much more anchored in the feminine energy, but you will find males who are much more anchored in the feminine energy more than certain women, you know. Um, so this thing, it is energy, and it is rising, and sometimes I, I dare say, 
and it might seem like a utopian um, description. I say, but if you honor a feminine energy, everything else follows. For example, I have a power that I didn't have previously, um, and I'm grateful for that. And one other thing to to be is uh, to honor this. We have to honor that feminine energy. It opens you to another world. It gives you to another power. And, and it's a beautiful thing watching it, you know. You know, I, I see my nephews, you know. Uh, it's much more in them than uh, probably me at that age, you know. So it is rising. And as you honor these two things, the ancestral spirit that is rising, the feminine energy that is rising, to me will fix a lot of, will fix a paradigm, basically. And it might seem ut utopian, but you have to do it. And the only way that I'm, I can do it is to live it. And now, I know, the voice says, you know, there's a lot of disharmony in the paradigm, you know. Write something, you know, so that you can take it to the paradigm, you know. Sure. And I am a black person, you know. So my inclinations, you know, are of a black person, you know. So I, I imagine, you know, I have this picture. We are sitting inside the crowd, you know, people of my race, I know, but there are other people outside the crowd who are listening, you know, people who are not my race, but they won't understand this concept the same way as the people who are in the crowd, you know. That was my thinking, you know. Um, and it's not here. It's not here at all. It's here, you know. And, 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 and when we talk these techniques of writing, they will tell you, you must write all the time, write all the time. And I'm like, yo, if you write all the time, you're gonna write shadow. Well, that's my, just my thinking, you know. Just go get um, inspiration and, you know, and pour something that will transcend, you know. Not only this decade, another decade, you know. Um, just like one last point. So we take the work now. Um, the work was published this year uh, in April. And so the voice says the work must reach the many. You know, so if I'm in Joburg, I'll probably be 250 uh, readings. If I'm in Cape Town, I'll probably, I did probably closer to 20. And just, just because it's the voice that is telling me that, that this message uh, must reach the man. It's not the purpose, it's telling me that I must, I must, I must um, go out there. But again, the voice says, and I knew it, it had told me, but I didn't know when I would make the U10. The U10 of going back to the rural heartland, the, the U10. Because there is a next level, you know, uh, of, uh, of healing ourselves physically. So, uh, building a homestead for the many, you know. If a person comes and sleeps for two weeks, it's fine. You can sleep for two weeks. If you want to come, if you want to contribute and water that garden, it's fine, you know. If you want to clap, you know, when we sing, it's fine. If you want to detoxify and cleanse oneself, you can use the herbs, you know. So, to me, it is the voice and that I'm honoring. This life is probably, majority of the time, is not, it's not mine, you know. I follow this voice. So, um, that's the only authority, you know, that um, push, pushes me around, you know. Um, I don't mean to be rude, but in the interest of time, I think that yes, the room would also like to die a question. So, in the Q&A, we can redirect, <coughs> but if other people could also just share today. I don't know if we have a mic for this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to comment on what you are discussing right now. Um, I'd I like to read this quote first. And this is from uh, Panachi's book. Uh, there is a section where she says, His ironance reminded the city of the words of Father Masika, who had claimed that too much education made people arrogant atheists, who because of too much learning and too much science, doubted the existence of Almighty God, Alpha and the Omega. And the reason I'm, I'm reading this is because some other things you cannot explain. Because the first words of Unachi said, he said he doesn't want to entertain uh, someone. For, for all you know, maybe this person is an atheist. And, and personally, I don't like people who don't believe anything. Uh, I'm from um, Apostolic Church. Those who are familiar with Apostolic Church, they know that there are those times when they sing a song. You know, people about to talk about Piper. I don't know what they call it in English. So... I'm disappointed you are discussing such a negative aspect because of minor people. Because me, when I first came across this book, 
We know there's a problem of people killing uh, uh, people with albinism. It's happening in African countries because they believe that it, it makes potent medicine. So I was very disappointed. I think we, the book was supposed to actually maybe uh, teach people something because the message of feminism it's in the book as well. So I, I just don't see the point of dwelling on a minority. So some other things you cannot explain. And I just want to ask a question if possible. Um, in the book that you talk about uh, the land of the working dead. So I just want, I have, I have a question. I, have a question. Um, I just want to understand what you are referring to because to me and I thought maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you are referring to the word of the working dead because uh, as Africans, I, I think on my side is, is it because we have lost ourselves? Um, or we are not in touch with our roots because most of my peers. Um, for example, some can they don't even know their claim names. For example, so of which, uh, according to me, you know that's that's how who you are. That that's my question. Um, to me, my reference to the land of the walking dead. Right? Can I please make a okay. suggestion? Please take more hands all the in case questions right. are going to end up uh, okay. duplicating. Yeah. 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 Take the questions. I'll just take all the questions and yeah. then we'll get back. Yeah. Um, my mind is more on a statement than, than a question. Um, you know, we, we, we live in a world where we believe we have different belief systems. And unfortunately, some of us think uh, maybe our belief systems are superior or better than, um, than, the, than, than, the, than the other. And uh, regarding uh, Ubud Nati explaining himself on, on from what perspective he was writing from, uh, yes, I also do believe it's unnecessary because um, white people, you know, want and have always wanted to control everything, um, the way we feel, what we eat, and, and so forth. If I'm writing about um, a traditional healing and um, some white person does not understand, I, I think it is a non-issue. Uh, there, there, there are things that they just must must not understand and they must just back off you know for, for, for lack of a for lack of a, for a better way if, if it's not for you it's, you don't understand uh, back off don't try to control it don't try to analyze it don't try to contextualize it because you'll never get there okay thank you I think we all have comments on that issue but in the interest of broadening the conversation if white people don't get it they don't get it cool <laughs> Thanks. Uh, my question is for Malaika, for Azania. Uh, you spoke about if you were to write something now, if you were to rewrite the book, you'd go into concepts like white supremacy and explain them deeper, and you'd write it differently. And when you say deeper, do you mean writing style? Because what you explain is you wrote the way you speak, so that it's accessible, so that it's simple to read. So if you were to rewrite and go deeper, what is it that you change? Your writing style, or do you mean in, in the sense of breaking down the words? I'm going to take five for now, and then let the writers answer, and then if we have time, we'll take another five, eh? Um, my question is for Lututu Lutu Malingani. Um, I wanted to find out, uh, when I just talk about uh, having different outlets for expression and you know he's got his calling as a healer as well as writing and you have photography as another outlet and um, I wonder to what extent the two uh, are at odds and to what extent they, they complement each other um, and maybe do you find refuge in one when the other isn't quite working with you at that particular moment? Um. Hello. Um, mine is also rather more of a comment, and there was an issue that sort of became sticky, which is the responsibility of a writer and that of a reader. And one of the things I learned from a number of authors, I mean, Agrada Colomba, first coming from a point of no one writes from a point of being objective. There's no such thing yeah. as objectivity when one writes. And that's the responsibility of the writer. In, in my opinion, would for the most part be to tell your story however much you feel it. And even with regard to the documentary that was mentioned earlier, uh, this comes from a perspective of, let's say, a white male who is privileged. And therefore, when 
Or is it a white? What is it? I'm not. Very hard to say. Definitely not white. Okay. Well, but this point is that if one arrives from the perspective from their own objective, with however much it may be. Uh, skewed to whatever, and that's what we will see as the reader, and also the responsibility of the reader. And I think that's also the thing, it's, a, it's an ever-changing thing, where the reader themselves develops over time. So I'll read a book today and understand it in a particular way, and then tomorrow I literally open the book and it's as if I've never read it. And so the responsibility of the reader as well is upon themselves to go on a quest to understand it more. And so, the, uh, in my opinion, the writers shouldn't then go out of their way to explain what white supremacy is. Because if you, as a reader, are intrigued by what you want, want means by white supremacy, you must then go on a quest to find out more and to uh, answer those questions that you have. Two questions to to all of the writers. I think what's really important about what Nancy said is that a lot of the time the language we take to speak about our suffering or our oppression or our situation is borrowed from the very systems and cultures and nationalisms that created. So you want to explain white supremacy, right? You want to explain blackness, and you then end up having to articulate in a language that is not black, right? That is built into this capitalist white supremacist world and I think the, the difficulty, the questions when they come up about well blackness isn't homogenous or uh, blackness is, is blackness queer and all these different questions that come up I think are answered by what Unati was saying is that if our reference point is not the language right, that creates our oppression then we open up the imagination to describe and discuss things differently. So I think the question I want to ask or my like is that in as much as you want to write for that child and you don't want that child to feel alienated, etc., by what you write, um, the genealogy of blackness is that it was created to make us feel a particular way, right? And so maybe the best thing you can do for that child is to make them uncomfortable, to challenge them, right? To create a situation in which they have to rethink all that they think they are and how they became to be it. Um, and so to what extent is, and I don't want to say appeasing blackness, but accepting a notion of blackness that is created outside of blackness, and then trying not to destabilize that notion, right? To what extent do we dis misunderstand what it means to love each other in a way that just doesn't challenge each other in a way that would be helpful to recreate our imaginings of ourselves, particularly if we're using the language of, of, of colonizers. And then I guess the question then, the second question I wanted to ask is, even the use of feminine power, when actually you speak of feminine powers on the rise, I feel like that language is also adopted, right? What is feminine? What is masculine? Uh, can you divorce these things from an understanding of gender? Uh, and if so, can you do it in English? Right? So the question I want to ask all three of you is on language. To what extent can can you write anything that's truly reflective of who we are outside of what we've been told we are in the language of the people who've created that notion of who we are? So maybe methodologically, how helpful is it to continue writing in a language that can't encompass right, the true concepts and notions of what we want to say? Uh, so taking it back to the writers, but you know, so this thing about language as in Ilin, so language is either Zulu and English or not language as nuance or concepts or knowledge systems. It's very confusing for me because now you're talking about translation and not understanding. And there's a long school of thought about Baldwin, about Audre Lorde have been writing about the fact that you're tasked as a black writer to fuck up and corrupt the language that you're speaking in. And I think we've done it successfully, otherwise we wouldn't be here. As I see Fundangi English is all. You know what I mean? It's as naturally our language as it is it theirs. It's a creole, it's a bastardization. And we are all its children because of colonization. You know? But anyway, see, see, your first question, no, it was your first question about what you meant about the land of the walking dead. But because we're already on this topic, if you could please respond to that. Okay. So, you see, I also think, and, and perhaps I should respond in English because I've been speaking Kapuya Gayabukasi, and I suppose it has created a bit of confusion. <coughs> And I say this because I think you misunderstood what I was saying. Because my argument was not that we must try to appease anyone. I specifically said 
are normally who are not even good, right? So there are specific people by who are. So I suppose in Indonesia we say I deliberately write so as not to hurt. So for that, I'm not at all looking to understand something, I'm born in something, also to understand, to see something different. To so it's basically to challenge and disturb. But I said it a couple more years, and you didn't understand it. And I'm saying it in English now, and you understand it. And so you see now where the conflict of language also comes in. But when I said it in in couple years, it confused. It's very confusing. And now I work at English is a bit more clearer. So the point I was making is, and, and, and on the issue of language, look, I mean, I think I, I, I hold the same view as you, right, about English, about just the language. I think often when we have this conversation about language, often when we have this conversation about language, we're not going into it the way, at least I don't think we're asking the questions that we should, and I don't think we're going into it as intensely as I think we should be going into it. It becomes an issue of, oh no, so if, you know, it's in English, therefore you can't, if it's in English, we can't talk about uh, decolonization, blackness, anything if it's going to be in English. And I don't think I agree with that kind of thinking, right? Um, I think language is a very powerful tool, regardless what language it is. I think language is a very powerful tool. I think it's a very powerful tool. I think English is a very powerful tool too. I think social is a powerful tool. I think every language is a powerful tool. And I do think that language as a tool, so we must be able to not necessarily separate, because I mean, there's not something you can do to separate the origins of a language and how its intentions have been and how it's used. But I think we must not be, I think for me at least, it, is, it becomes a little bit simplistic to argue that, you know, if, if it's in English, it can't be, it can't be speaking to black people. If it's in English, we can't, we can't even, you know, corrupt in a way, in a way, you can't even corrupt that. We can't, you know, we can't claim and own some of these. Some of them, I think some of the best works I've ever read, some put in Kerelo, some put in Marco, who works written in English, one of them, my favorite books, everyone, any kind of, it's completely, you know, deconstructs this whole thing decolonization. It is done, but it's written in English, and I would never have access to it if they were to that one, because English is on, you know? And I don't think her work loses meaning or becomes irrelevant because it's in English. I don't think it loses its power because it's written in English. I think she communicated a very important message to me as a young black girl, and that book remains my favorite book. I think it's the best book ever written in the world, okay? I've read many books, and I'm saying Nervous Conditions is the best book ever written in the world. And it, it meant, and it means a lot to me as a black girl, Oko, Mirale, Nsiko, Zoneti, Kosoweto, as it probably does, a girl who's in Harare, who's in Shivu, there in Zimbabwe, who did was writing Gary Conditions, someone. So can and, I just... Yeah. Are you done? Are you done? I want to answer your question. Yeah, yeah, I want to go around and everybody has a chance to question and answer them separately. Sure. Instagram photographer? Uh, which question am I answering? You asked me for this question mm -hmm. about your photography as an outlet? Um... I mean, it's, it's, for me, I think it's, it's an ongoing sort of navigating the two, right? Um, because I think, I mean, I, I, I don't know at what point do I decide that it's better to take a photograph of a thing and not write about it, right? So I think the, the decision for me is, is always kind of um, made on the spot that I, you know, I want to take a picture, but also I want to write about it. So I think in a way, it, 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 I don't know if it works together, but I, I do think that my thinking process is, 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 is the same when I'm approaching either of those. So the idea for me is to kind of like take an image that has that has a lot in it, an image that you can look at and interpret it and, and be able to read what is going in the image and the same for the writing. So I think for me those kind of like work um, in, in that form. The photography I think helps me to avoid people a little bit as well. So you know, I just take out my camera and people, you know, you can't talk to me. So I suppose that works in that way, but I think for, for me the, the idea for me I think even in my writing is to kind of like write these images that people can read the book and they can see it. So this works in a way with the, with the, with the photography because that's what photography is, that you choose a frame and you decide what's in it. What do you choose to put forward in that image and what do you choose to kind of play out of that image. So I think my writing works in that same way, that I write these things that I intentionally manipulate what people see and what they don't see and what kind of like hangs on the periphery. So that's basically how I work, yeah. Um, Do you remember the question? Yes, um, I use the phrase the living dead or the walking 
dead, purposeful and deliberately. And it was, uh, was trying just to shock the reader outside the five senses of reality and focus on the comprehensiveness of life, the fullness of life. The world in its entirety doesn't start at the physical level. And I use that language purposefully so that the reader is uncomfortable and they can begin to explore life outside the five senses of reality. If I'm answering you short. See, see? Um, Unwele Zilanga is in English. The book that I'm writing in English. Uh, the next book after that is in Kosa. Um, so to me, I will use Kosa if I want to, and I will use um, uh, English if I want to. And in this case, we wanted to reach as much people as possible, because we believe that the message is, um, is important. And there will be time, you know, if there are resources to translate the work, you know, to Kosa, you know. Uh, our launch of this work, we did it in Kobe, where people speak to one and don't speak to one, but the work was, uh, like, they put me on, you know, and, 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 and if I did it in Kosa, there will be a barrier. Sure, there will come a time when I write in Kosa, but um, now we want the work to be out there and reach as much people as possible. So we use the language that is common to many people. If we had the language, you know, that we were using Swahili, you know, uh, throughout Africa, then probably I would use that. But in English, is the language that most people speak. So that, that's the reasoning. But there will come a time when I use my, my mother tongue. Okay, thank you guys for all being generous with your time and your attention. I think everybody's available to get harassed by you for a little bit after. Um, so bon. Thank you.